All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining HTNG's blockchain webinar series. I'd like to welcome uh, all of the attendees and our chair, uh, Doug Rice, who is joining us today, our chair of the blockchain work group. Uh, we're also joined by a fellow work group member and contributor to the blockchain for hospitality white paper, which was published a few weeks ago and is available on htng.org. Uh, would Doug, would you please introduce today's presenter for this webinar on the summary of blockchain use cases? Thanks, Armand. Uh, be happy to do that. And I also like to acknowledge the contribution of my fellow co-chair, Andrew Sanders, who unfortunately had a, a client contact conflict today and couldn't join us. Uh, but without further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce Max stevens Giel from Cognitive, who has worked quite hard to put together this presentation on hospitality use cases of blockchain. Max? Perfect. Thanks, Doug. Um, First, I have to get mouse focus, <laughs> sorry. Um, so here's just a quick uh, overview of how we're gonna spend the next uh, 40 minutes uh, talking about uh, use cases of blockchain <clears throat> coming out of the, uh, the research that we did in the white paper. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump into it. So just a little bit about myself. I've spent uh, the last 20 years in technology in various different roles. Um, I, some years ago, spent uh, time as an author on uh, a research study with Don Tapscott on IT and competitive advantage. That was a, close to 10 years ago now. And uh, what we thought was uh, a rapid pace of technology evolution that certainly uh, has, has increased. Um, and as that um, evolution uh, continues, uh, new technologies like blockchain come along. And I think that any discussion about where IT is going needs to include blockchain and um, in the discussion. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about how <clears throat> we see blockchain playing out in, uh, in the hospitality industry. And this Dilbert kind of jumps to the, the chase, which is that it's a very open-ended question. I'm going to try to summarize some of our findings and elaborate on a few in the specific. Um, but before I discuss the use cases, let's talk a little bit about what blockchain is and why it's interesting to us. So Although we covered this in Andrew and Doug's Blockchain 101 webinar that's available online uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, here's a quick recap. So <clears throat> although blockchain technology sounds uh, confusing at first, at its core, it's actually pretty simple. The blockchain is a list of public records, a ledger, where transactions between parties are stored. Um, each record, known as a block, is secured using cryptography. And one of the most important uh, aspects of this blockchain technology is that the data is decentralized with information shared and stored across a peer-to-peer -peer network. In practice, this really means thousands of, of, of computers out, out there. Each block contains information about some records, a timestamp, and importantly, a mathematical summary of the block that preceded it. To write a block, you need consensus from the majority of the nodes in the network. And the blocks are written all of the time, and because each block records a summary about the preceding one, it's virtually impossible to sort of go back in time and change one without being noticed. So in this fast decentralized network of nodes, there's no central point of vulnerability or failure, and the data itself is resistant to modification and unwanted tampering. So these attributes combined to create a very trustful network in which the parties can transact securely. Now this diagram here just speaks to the basic storing of records on the chain. When used to store cryptocurrency, we record transactions against wallets and use the ledger to ensure that the money changes hands within a single transaction. The blockchain is a lot more <clears throat> general than just exchanging money. Newer blockchain platforms like Ethereum have introduced smart contracts to make this exchange programmatic. Now we can automate how the transactions occur. And these same smart contracts have been used to make the blockchain more extensible enabling the creation of new types of cryptocurrency using tokens. We'll talk <clears throat> later about some of the companies who have created their own tokens to support specific types of transactions like room bookings and loyalty rewards. Now, the underlying details of how the blockchain works is going to be uh, addressed in a webinar by uh, Andrew and his colleague from DataArt on uh, December the 20th. We've got a list of the webinars that are upcoming in this series at the uh, end of this presentation today. So my presentation is just gonna focus on the very high level. So <clears throat> you're here today because you've heard about blockchain and you wanna know more about how it might be used in hospitality. No doubt you've 
you've heard the hype, the promises uh, surrounding this technology. And the Star, Star Trek analogy here, we're boldly going where no database has gone before. Each initial coin offering has a unique solution problem uh, th that nobody knew existed. And every second person is doing something revolutionary. Blockchain is the solution for everything, they say. But <clears throat> despite uh, all of this hype, there have been precious few successes. I read in a recent Deloitte study that 92% of the 26,000 blockchain projects announced over the last two years are, are dead. Many of those projects may have had good intentions, but poor execution. And some of them were outright scams. But in amongst all that noise, some really good ideas have emerged. Uh, I like to think of it as that today's blockchain is a version 1.0. And with that version 1.0, we're seeing a lot of teething pains. But it's a bit more complicated than that because in most deployments, it's a version 1.0 of a collection of version 1.0s. We've got digital identity, digital wallets, decentralized networks, new governance schemes, new revenue models, new legislation, new security paradigms, you name it, we're taking on new. And of course, with that comes an inevitable bit of chaos. But let's step aside from the hype and focus on the attributes that make blockchain useful in business. Uh, there are four key characteristics. First, it's designed to be distributed and synchronized across a global network, which makes it ideal for business, business uses such as hospitality. It encourages organizations to come up from behind their firewalls and share data. And it's also, of course, what's attracting companies to come in and disrupt to try to disintermediate the existing middlemen. Second, it's transparent. If multiple parties are involved in a business transaction, the blockchain ensures that all the parties have visibility to all the transactions. And it also ensures that the transactions fail if all of the involved parties don't agree to the terms and conditions under which the transaction was carried out. So this really enables trust amongst the parties and it makes it very secure. Third, the data is immutable. Once you've agreed on a transaction and recorded it, it can never be changed. Sure, you can go back and subsequently record another transaction on the asset, but you can never hide the original transaction. Using this, we can determine what we call the provenance of assets, which means that for any asset, you can tell where it is, where it's been, and what's happened throughout its life. And fourth, using smart contracts, we can make the blockchain programmable. And this provides us with the ability to automate transactions amongst parties in a predefined way. In essence, we can put the shared business logic into the blockchain and ensure that the contracts that we enter into will be transacted as defined at the point of signing without relying on intermediary third parties and proprietary software. So taken together, these four characteristics provide the, uh, all the participants with secure transactions and an indelible record with potential savings in time and cost. As part of Don's uh, study that I mentioned at the outset, <clears throat> we came up with a, a way of looking at different business opportunities and talked about them being two possible outcomes, either reduced operational cost or increased top line. Um, and in rare circumstances, sometimes both. Well, as this database like nature might imply, many of the blockchain benefits are oriented towards reducing operational costs, be they lowered transactional costs, reduced compliance oversight, faster closings, increases in trust and certainty, or simplified data exchanges to support partnerships and the like. And on the other side, when it comes to the top line, it may not necessarily be direct revenue. It can be anything that'll contribute to the top line. Things like indirect marketing and profile building, increased visibility and consumer demand, the ability to connect directly with consumers rather than going through middlemen and so on. And as we go through these use cases today, let's consider what will lead to successful adoption and also what will hinder it. Well, if consumers are involved, we need low friction. Consumers need something that's easy to understand, easy to use, and integrates into their digital existence. They want something that's low risk, trustable, and consistent. Ideally, what we really want is for blockchain to be invisible. From a merchant's perspective, there needs to be some, something uh, sufficiently compelling. An old boss told me once that uh, you have to be three times better at something in order to displace an incumbent. I'm not sure if he was talking about my work effort, but be it as it may, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, I think we can all agree that switching costs are high. We're not going to change how we're doing something just because. And as with 
cons consumers, merchants want ease of use, reliability, cost efficiency, and speed. We also, with blockchain, have a proverbial chicken and egg problem, especially around cryptocurrencies. To transact anything, we need two parties. We need buyers and sellers. And there's no point in supporting cryptocurrency payments if consumers don't have funds in their cryptocurrency wallets. And consumers won't unless they have a place to use them. So there are a lot of barriers to success. And although this isn't really the focus of, of today's discussion, they'll come up um, frequently as I uh, discuss the use cases and try to temper the hype that surrounds blockchain with a dose of uh, pragmatism. So in our study, we identified a number of different areas that we think blockchain can be applied in hospitality, uh, identity, payments, distribution, and loyalty. Identity is a great use case. In 20 years uh, from now, air passenger traffic is expected to double to over 8 billion passenger flights. <laughs> of course, put another way, it's 4 billion passenger flights today. Uh, each of these travelers on these flights needs to be identified, verified, and authorized at multiple steps in their journey. So how can blockchain address this? Well, it's a global, it provides global access to data with very high availability. It can provide an immutable, trustable store of information and can be set up so that only those with the right access can retrieve specific information. An existing concept that's uh, re recently received uh, increased visibility courtesy of blockchain is the notion of a self-sovereign identity. This is a, a, a portable identity that lasts a lifetime. A portable in this case, meaning that it can, it, it can follow the individual and not belong to a particular organization. And this sovereign identity enables the holder to present verifiable credentials in a privacy safe way. So a self-sovereign identity, be it for a person, an organization, or a thing, can be stored on the blockchain, and the amount of information disclosed during the transaction can be determined based on the wishes of the identity holder themselves. In terms of security, this sovereign identity enables privacy by design, so that your identity identity data can be secure, encrypted, tamper-proof, and unusable for any other purpose than what you intended for. Uh, at the same time, it eliminates the need for a single authority to own, process, or store the data. And as you can imagine, this becomes increasingly important as we move between different uh, countries and different organizations. So the source, of history, uh, source and history of the data is verifiable by everyone, but the details are only released on a need-to-know basis. With widespread adoption, a blockchain-based digital identity scheme that combines information about our citizenship, visas, qualifications, entitlements, and the like, is not hard to imagine how we can streamline a, a traveler's journey. A variety of organizations are, are advocating and trialing blockchain-based approaches to identity management. We looked at a couple. The IATA uh, One ID project seeks to accelerate travel through the customer's journey from ready to fly, bag drop, security screening, outbound border controls, boarding, uh, inbound border, and of course, hopefully from our perspective, checking into hotels and attractions. One ID seeks to introduce a streamlined, friction-free and passenger-centric process to enable the individual to assert their identity online or in person to the required level at each process step while maintaining the privacy of their personal data. Their goal is to deliver a personalized customer experience to be more cost efficient and, and secure and to create an opportunity to in, in generate ancillary revenue. To make this happen, they entered a partnership with uh, VChain, a UK-based startup that's blockchain-based. And they did a pilot in 2017 and announced that they're going to be rolling out something with British Airways and Iberia, who have likewise made an investment in VChain. Another we looked at was CETA. Uh, <clears throat> CETA is the in-house technology provider to most of the airlines. With their show card project, they envision passengers creating a verification token on their mobile phone, which contains biometric and other personal data. In this vision of future travel, no matter where you are in the world uh, you, you go, any authority can simply scan your face and your device to verify you are an authorized traveler. And this can be done without all those agencies ever controlling or storing your biometric details or personal information. Of course, hopefully in this vision of the world, everyone has a fully charged phone when they land. CETA's proof of concept is built on ShowCard, a supplier of enterprise identity uh, authentication. And interestingly, ShowCard in turn is built on top of Stellar, an open source distributed blockchain platform that we'll also talk about <clears throat> on the payment side. 
Uh, last but not least, we've got the WEF, and they recently released a white paper calling for a global identity management solution. And although there's, this initiative is conceptual, it has broad support from airports, governments, airlines, and hotels. And an entity like the WEF, which transcends a specific sector and is global in focus, may indeed be the type of change agent that's required to move things forward. For identity management is one of those enabling technologies that's going to reduce operational costs. And of course, uh, there are going to be claims to create revenue, but those are going to lightly go to the in intermediaries and service providers required to deploy a solution. For even if the blockchain itself is distributed, there's still a multitude of services required to operate the system as a whole. Now to make identity systems work, it's going to require a lot of standardization and harmonization of frameworks, processes, data models, and data interchange protocols. Beyond that, these systems need to be cost effective and scalable. There's a myth in the blockchain universe that there are no intermediaries and the costs are minimal. To ex but to exchange tokens on the blockchain does require mining uh, to create and store the blocks. For example, on the Ethereum-based networks, the underlying cost of these operations is called gas, which as recently as July uh, jumped to over a dollar, making it really impractical for microtransactions. Scalability is another consideration. If identity is to take off, we need to be able to support thousands and thousands of transactions per second. But most of these mainstream blockchains uh, in place today support just a few dozen. Obviously a challenge. Um, the organizations I just outlined are pursuing the same thing, uh, this, this IATA, CETA, and, and the World Economic Forum. I'm sure they'd be happy to settle on just one. It's one of those use cases where it would best benefit from public sector involvement. And perhaps the fastest way to get adoption would be for a government to mandate it. And our, our thoughts are that if this happens, it'll likely happen at a domestic level first, and then perhaps between countries that see a lot of cross-border traffic, then between more and so on. And as far as the hospitality industry is concerned, we'll see the most benefit if the systems are multinational in scope, and hopefully we won't have to wait too long. Second area we looked at was payments. As Doug and Andrew discussed a few weeks back, blockchain is an enabling technology and independent of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. However, the two are linked in the public conscience. One of the major attributes of cryptocurrency, that of speculation, drew the crowds. But now with the markets falling, it's working in the opposite direction. And combined with some well-publicized exchange and wallet hacks, uh, some volatility and high transaction costs, consumer adoption of cryptocurrency payments is pretty slow. In fact, even after 10 years, there's still less than a billion dollars a year being exchanged for services using Bitcoin. For many large companies like Expedia, they've given up on accepting crypto due to the costs and poor customer experience. Looking at payments from a hospitality perspective, we need solutions that are easy to adopt by all parties to the transaction, be it either a B2B or a B2C one. And although it's unlikely that customers will adopt an industry-specific payment method, some, like Travela and Lockchain, have created their own. Uh, others, like CryptoCribs, have distinguished themselves by only accepting crypto. But I can't help but observe that, although these business models might have made a lot of sense in last year's hyperinflationary markets, they look increasingly dubious with the rapid plunge downwards in this crypto cycle. It's just hard to build a business when you have such an un unpredictable foundation. Perhaps a, a, a more interesting or, and logical place for, for um, cryptocurrencies to take hold will be on business-to-business -business, uh, um, applications. Uh, we looked a little bit at uh, electronic funds transfer, and this is where money is being transferred between banks around the globe. The magnitude of the numbers might come as some surprise, at literally tens of millions of transfers per day. So these are wire transfers, and they've got an average value of about 50,000 each. So we're <laughs> aggregated, it's about $5 trillion a day. All this money flowing around needs to be accounted for in a ledger, and each participant needs to have passed a know your customer check. Each exchange needs to be tracked such that the provenance of each transfer is known, and so on. And the global standard today for performing this is an entity called SWIFT. And they charge about $25 for every transfer. Well, starting at around 2012, a blockchain startup called Ripple has been working to create an alternative to electronic funds transfer between business entities. We've got about 100 banks on board 
uh, buying into the idea that faster transfers and lower cost settlements. The SWIFT isn't sitting still. IBM and their partner Stellar, the same company that I <coughs> mentioned earlier, um, recently demonstrated an even higher performance, lower cost blockchain based solution at SWIFT's latest governance summit. They've also demonstrated that the process works at scale in a proof of concept deployment in the South Pacific through a company called ClickX. But both Ripple and, and Stellar are based on a very similar blockchain technology that's several orders of magnitude faster than Bitcoin and Ethereum at around 4,000 transactions per second. Uh, interestingly, it's this, one of the same engineers behind both of those systems. From a point of reference, this 4,000 transactions makes it a little bit faster than Visa on a slow day. Uh, not necessarily Black Friday, but um, a, a good indicator of, of the type of transactional volume that's required. So given the huge amount of money that is at stake, this is literally going to be a hotly contested market. In our discussion about payments, we should also mention different forms of value exchange, uh, like using tokens to pay for content, such as reviews and pictures. Uh, I didn't drill into that as much as, uh, as I could, um, but uh, I did come across a company called Cool Cousin, which is an Israeli startup, and they run a travel guide-like service that uses tokens to pay for content contributions, for instance. Well, payments are challenging. The speculative nature, the complicated user interfaces, and the high transactional costs have slowed adoption. But um, I'm optimistic. I think there's a good chance that once the rough edges are rounded off, blockchain-based payments will be packaged up in an easier to use uh, format uh, and go mainstream. I think we'll likely start with B2B. As I'm sure everybody on the call is aware, uh, distribution uh, within the hospitality industry is convoluted. It's inconsistent, it's expensive, and it's inefficient. In short, it's kind of a classic for disruption. Um, the diagram on the right hand side is a little blurry. I apologize for that, um, but I think it's, it's largely deliberate. It underscores just how many different uh, pieces there are in, uh, between a traveler and a hotel in the booking process. Um, today's online travel agencies are a key part of, of any hotel's distribution strategy. Expedia and Priceline control about 95% of the online reservations in the U.S. and close to 70% globally. As a channel, they can represent up to 40% of a hotel's bookings. So to get bookings, a hotel has to play nice with the big OTAs. And by playing nice, we mean giving up to 30% commission. And what's worse for the hotel is that the OTAs now own the relationship with the consumer. The hotels have to struggle to achieve brand recognition and repeat bookings. I read that some hospitality experts have recommended that hotels capitulate and give their entire inventory to the OTAs and to just focus their time and money on providing the best possible experience to the guests. But that's giving up a lot, too much one might say. Well, many hotels are trying hard to reduce their dependencies on the OTAs by increasing direct bookings. And despite all their efforts, their ROIs remain largely unsatisfactory. This is a battle that hotels can't win on their own. But as we'll see, there are a number of blockchain-based companies that are trying to change this. Arise is a, a member of the HCNG, and they're going to be speaking, uh, I believe, on the 17th. Um, looking at their website, they get right to the point. They're out to fix the mess by putting rates and availability onto the blockchain. In their words, currently hotels send their room and rate information over networks that have been pieced together from third-party services each with their own APIs, data formats, and local caches. And each of these services takes a cut of hotel booking revenue or charges for connectivity. Arise argues that these intermediaries are difficult to connect to, often incorrect as the rates and availability information is stale, and they act as a single point of failure. So Arise is uh, building a blockchain-based solution using smart contracts, modern graph query languages, and some other cool stuff to try to streamline this process. Another we looked at was Go Eureka. They're based out of Singapore. And this blockchain-based startup is claiming zero commission fees and the creation of interoperable loyalty points between independent hotels. Curiously, they claim to have 400,000 hotels available. And so this implies that they're booking through bed banks rather than direct. So there's still a lot of costs there. And of course, very difficult to implement a loyalty program across things that you're sourcing through a third party. Their ICO completed on Friday. ICO is an initial coin offering. It's a way of which some of these companies fund themselves. 
and it's a little bit hard to find out the details, but it looks like they raised about 10 million out of the 60 million that they were looking for. Now, even if it was all cash, um, it's not going to be much in the way of marketing funds to comp compete against the big guys. Another we looked at was Locktrip. They're a Bulgarian-based um, uh, company, and one of the they also had an ICO, and they followed through on delivering with an end-to-end -end B2C uh, solution. You can try it out on the uh, on at least the Android App Store. I believe it's also on on Apple. Uh, unfortunately, in trying it out you know, with a few spot checks, their pricing wasn't at parity with Expedia, uh, to say nothing of being 20% less as they claimed. Still, and they're more transparent than most of the ICO funded organizations and they're worth looking at if just for that reason. Alting uh, out of Taiwan has been around for a few, few years. Um, they were founded by an ex-Google China employee and they're a diversified supply chain company. They, uh, they started with food distribution, but now they're moving into hotels, loyalty and payment, all of which is based on the blockchain. Um, they're certainly ambitious, but it's not clear if they can execute on all of these developments simultaneously. Winding Tree, another HCNG workgroup member, is a Swiss-based organization working to create decentralized, uh, a decentralized data infrastructure. They're working with Air New Zealand, Nordic Choice Hotels, Lufthansa, Air France, KLM, and others on various different projects. Um, and although they conducted an ICO, unlike any of the others here, they've set themselves up as a nonprofit. They hope to have a, uh, a proof of concept hotel booking by the end of this year. Uh, I believe they may also be speaking uh, in one of our webinars later this month. Uh, <clears throat> last we looked at was uh, TUI, a lar the largest tourism company in the world. They were an early adopter of blockchain technology with the launch of their in-house bed swap project. This blockchain enables them to assess demand and to move inventories between different points of sale in real time. And from there, it can adjust selling margins based on demand. Unlike the others that uh, mentioned here, they've deployed a private blockchain to create a centralized view of rates and availability across their internal properties. Now, they're not ruling out exposing this in the future, but for now, they're using blockchains for gains in operational efficiency internally. Well, looking across all these different examples, there's a sense of acknowledgement of the problem, but a focus on a technology solution. Some like GoEureka may be leveraging the decentralized nature of the blockchain to support integration, but they're really no different from existing OTAs in the, in the sense that they want to provide the, the full booking experience. Trying to take on Priceline and Expedia head on with their huge resources and leverage is gonna require some really deep pockets. What's not often mentioned in the discussion of revolution is that the incumbent OTAs succeed in attracting consumers by spending a significant amount of the money they make on marketing. Those companies that, are, that claim that they're not gonna charge any or almost any commission are gonna to have to find alternate sources of revenue to drive their businesses. Uh, it also seems to be, uh, be a belief that just because distribution is put into the hands of, uh, or put on the blockchain, the other operational aspects, the sales and business development, the curation of data and content, the resolving of, of booking issues, the ensuring, re ensuring regulatory compliance, et cetera, is gonna disappear. But the reality is that these tasks consume a lot of resources in a small market and significantly more than what, when one goes global. Another aspect of distribution that we looked at um, that uh, can leverage blockchain's transparency is the efficient and decentralized procurement of supplies. The larger hotel or uh, hospitality enterprises typically employ a franchise model where the enterprise owns the brand but not the physical properties. Now, this reduces CapEx requirements but puts the onus on the enterprise to ensure the quality of the suppliers to the franchisees. From a, uh, for a large a chain with hundreds of franchisees and thousands of suppliers, they need visibility into the supply chain's performance and quality. The belief is that by putting all the transactions onto a shared ledger, uh, they can achieve this. The provenance of each element is traceable and time is saved in tracking, uh, payment, dispute resolution, and paperwork. This can result in some cost benefits for both the brand and the franchisee. There are also other initiatives seeking to ensure traceability and food distribution the sort of proverbial from farm to plate uh, and putting that on the blockchain. And these developments are primarily around retail grocery today, but they will become relevant to the hospitality industry once they gain traction. So let's round things out by talking about how we can leverage blockchain 
to support an ongoing relationship with the consumer. The hospitality sector benefits from repeat customers and therefore retaining customer loyalty is very important. The value proposition for blockchain and loyalty revolves around driving down the cost of creating a secure ecosystem for operators while also reducing friction for consumers and making it easier for them to earn and burn the points they accumulate. Each loyalty program has a set of rules for how accumulated points can be redeemed, with whom, where, and when, based on the program's uh, rules and the member's standing. These rules can get complicated quickly. Loyalty programs today are challenged by the costs associated with running these schemes. These costs are so significant that it often prevents smaller operators from running or joining a program. And the thought is that by decentralizing the consumer's membership onto a blockchain and using smart contracts, all parties within the program's ecosystem can transact efficiently and securely. There's full traceability, the provenance that we mentioned earlier, and using those smart contracts, <clears throat> there's the added ability to ensure that the terms and conditions of the program are enforced automatically. The concept of tokenization allows members to monetize or exchange their royalty points. Tokenizing is the conversion of loyalty points into a type of cryptocurrency, and it makes it uh, easy to support transactions across merchants in a network, and indeed, even between different loyalty programs. For example, for a member to trade points they have earned with the airline for hotel points and vice versa, or to exchange it for other cryptocurrencies or even fiat money. This can be a bit contentious as many loyalty operators are wedded to the idea of member lock-in and specifically don't want them, uh, their, their members to take their points to other brands. But we're not gonna dive too deeply into loyalty applications as we've set up a specific webinar that Charles from, uh, or sorry, Chuck from Currency Alliance is gonna be giving on December 10th. Or here's just a sampling of the solutions that you might wanna look over in the interim. Loyal was one of the earliest blockchain uh, loyalty applications. They used the blockchain to support exchanging points between participating programs, all secured, uh, securely enabled using smart contracts. This lowers costs and improves profitability for program operators. They don't sell their services directly to consumers, and rather they're a, a white label supplier. Well, TripKey uh, is another we looked at. They started uh, to make use of the blockchain through the launch of its loyalty reward system. Again, the service benefits from cutting out the uh, third party involvement and provides a direct connection between hotels and customers. Uh, customers are rewarded with native trip tokens for staying at a hotel or using the hotel's amenities. And the trip tokens are recorded in a ledger and they don't expire and they can be used to book fu uh, future visits or exchange for cash in their system. Cathay Pacific, the airline, announced a partnership with Accenture uh, that they'll be leveraging blockchain to support their Asia Miles loyalty program. The principal benefit that they're claiming is operational efficiency. By decentralizing uh, onto the blockchain, uh, the updates between the partners and the members occur in real time. And members will also be presented with new gamification features to drive engagement. Currency Alliance, the company that Chuck leads, uh, he'll talk more about it next week, but in brief, they're a white label loyalty provider uh, that provides that focuses on bridging loyalty programs. They've got considerable experience in deploying blockchain based programs, but as I understand it, aren't using blockchain exclusively as the cost to process transactions on mainstream platforms are prohibitively expensive for the type of microtransactions that they focus on. Now, there are uh, many companies pitching blockchain loyalty programs, but they are often missing a key ingredient, and that's a large membership base. Rakuten of Japan has that. Earlier this year, they announced that they're deploying a blockchain-based payment scheme based on their own cryptocurrency, Rakuten Coin. This runs on their Viber network, which I was astonished to learn boasts over a billion users, uh, primarily in, in Southeast Asia uh, and Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, users of Viber can, can redeem points within Rakuten and its partners networks. Uh, by the way, there's a, a neat connection with hospitality here because Rakuten actually got their start selling hotel rooms online. They're now much more diversified with banking, credit cards, e-commerce, digital content, and communication offerings. You might know them here in North America as ebates.com, uh, the old buy.com, or Kobo, the e-reader. So how does blockchain benefit Rakuten? Well, by concentrating all the rewards in a single branded token, 
Rakuten coin, they immediately solve the problem of fragmentation of the rewards points across their different loyalty programs. And of course, it's a no brainer that Rakuten coin is gonna be redeemable for all products uh, across the groups. You could just argue, or you might argue that blockchain, uh, that this is really just blockchain lipstick on a traditional coalition loyalty program. But the blockchain token that they've created is different. Sure, these tokens aren't unlike the point system and gift cards that companies have used to retain their uh, loyalty members for decades. But what changes when you record these transactions on blockchain is that they become e um, easily and securely transferable. Rakuten doesn't need to negotiate with all the merchants in Japan, let alone the world, to accept Rakuten points. They don't need to. Um, in creating Rakuten coin, they've created a means of exchange with other currencies. Their goal seems to be pre uh, pretty clear. They want to create liquidity by enabling consumers to freely trade their Rakuten coins for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are already accepted by tens of thousands of merchants, and to increase consumer sentiment and less loyalty. As of June of this year, over a trillion super points had been converted to Rakuten points, uh, sorry, Rakuten coins, uh, totaling about $9 billion. Uh, Still, with all the uh, volatility in this uh, crypto market, it's going to be interesting to see how this type of points to currency exchange plays out. Well, wrapping up, we've, uh, we've described the uh, unique aspects of blockchain and how it benefits several different use cases within the hospitality industry. And although many of the examples are early stage and yet to achieve significant traction, I think we can see that while it may not be revolutionary, uh, there are many opportunities to advance, especially on the enterprise side. Uh, Lufthansa recently ran a contest uh, for, for companies to participate or propose uh, blockchain applications, and they attracted uh, 312 entries. And these weren't kids' science fair projects. Uh, th this is an industry at large responding to a very uh, big opportunity. Almost every major player in enterprise technology has either a blockchain-based practice or products in the market. Technology is not going to be the problem here. It's going to be the design of systems, taking into account all of the parties and designing for their needs. Finally, I want to point you at a McKinsey analysis uh, of the strategic value of blockchain. And they provided some pretty good insights. There's a, a bitly link down at the bottom there. Uh, their assessment was that blockchain is still three to five years away from deployment at scale primarily because of the difficulties in resolving what they call the co-opetition paradox. That's around, that's the, uh, the negotiation and the, uh, and, and the standardization efforts necessary to uh, uh, create um, environments in which multiple parties can transact. They also uh, point out that blockchain doesn't have to be a disintermediator in order to generate value. Rather, uh, they, they, they claim blockchain could sort of become a glue that binds together rather than divides. Um, they also pointed out that, uh, um, uh, as we assess, that most of the early uh, adoption and, and successes are going to be around cost reduction. They attribute 70% of the benefit here um, rather than uh, transformative business models. So just in recapping, if you remember the comment I made about version 1.0 early on, this is a very fast changing landscape. And some of these early experiments have shown enough promise that larger companies are now making some fairly significant investments. The ones with the least dependencies will likely show fruit first, but with, um, with payment and identity evolving fairly rapidly, we can expect progress in more complex multi-party markets, such as distribution and loyalty to follow. The next several years, the version twos and version threes, if you will, are gonna be very interesting to watch. Well, thanks very much for Following along, I guess we can turn over things to uh, any questions that people might have. Great, Max. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great summary of many of the ways the blockchain is being developed to solve challenges in, in travel and hospitality. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, again, please direct those to me in the chat window, and I'll ask our presenter, uh, Max, and also our one of our chairs uh, of the blockchain for hospitality work group, Doug Rice is on the line. Um, and we had one question uh, or a, a series of questions coming in from Gaj. Um, and I'll ask them in, in single parts, Max, uh, to you or, or Doug, if you wanna chime in on them as well. Mm -hmm. um, this first question is, you know, what is a fiat currency? Can you offer some 
clarification? Oh, that, that would is? be just a traditional uh, paper-based currency, as opposed and, to as opposed to a cryptocurrency. Gotcha. And and are devalued currencies exempt from this system? I'm not sure what we mean by devalued currency. Yeah, um, and I suppose uh, currencies that um, are, are, are fiat, fiat currencies that um, have fluctuating uh, values, but I guess mm. those are probably uh, separate from this. Are, are there any monetary policy restrictions in participating in, in blockchain-based payments? Uh, well, I guess th there's a w Bitcoin is now uh, is, has passed the test as a currency. Um, some most of the regulatory focus uh, in the in the crypto market at large has been around ICOs and trying to determine whether or not they're a security and not a currency. Um, I confess I am not following the ins and outs of that uh, in in much detail, but I do know that progress has been made. Um, I certainly, I think that from a recording of transactions on the pure blockchain and the regulatory aspects around that. There's been some really interesting um, steps uh, to uh, to enshrine that in law. I believe that uh, Bermuda just passed some legislation this spring, um, uh, providing some regulatory framework around um, how that's going to happen. Um, and given that they're part of the Commonwealth, it's sort of uh, if it's passed passed that uh, acid test, it'll probably go further. I can add a little bit of flavor to that, perhaps. I think that main uh, regulatory environment around cryptocurrencies has been around the, the user interfaces of the wallets that consumers tend to use to get in and out. The, the regu regulators, the tax regulators in particular, want to know where money is moving. And it, you know, while you can move money between two Bitcoin accounts or any cryptocurrency without really transacting through one of the wallets, getting money in and out from the regular banking system generally requires a wallet. So that's where the focus of the regulation has been. It's the place that they can regulate. So they, they're regulating them like banks in increasing numbers of countries, including U.S. Great clarification. Um, so, uh, and regarding the devalued currencies, I think the example um, was referring to, or the question was referring to, like Zimbabwe or Venezuela. Um, do you have any, any thoughts or comments on how those those currencies um, can participate in in the in the blockchain? If there's any way to preclude them, or is it... uh, I haven't followed it that closely, but I do know that Venezuela was pursuing a blockchain currency um, in the face of uh, some significant deflation. Um, I, I did actually, just as an anecdote, um, notice that despite the hand wringing that people have had about the rapid uh, devaluation of, of uh, Bitcoin, that actually there are a number of, of uh, global currencies that have, um, uh, of, of global fiat currencies that have actually devalued um, more this year than, than those, I, I believe Argentina and, uh, and Venezuela being the two examples. Um, I could, the uh, one of the biggest challenges that I didn't want to harp on too much during, um, during the session was is, is around the speculative nature of uh, cryptocurrencies that in many respects actually kind of um, uh, distracts from the uh, the underlying technology advantage that blockchain provides um, and uh, so where we look at it from the hospitality perspective, um, we were thinking about the broader business applications. I think the, the cryptocurrency aspect is a whole nother discussion entirely. Absolutely, yeah, perhaps um, you know, some of the new stable coins will be something that we need to look into further. I'm not sure if you've done any research on that, uh, Max, any of the stable coins that are starting to be developed. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, for instance, the Stellar uh, and Stellar and Ripple, they actually, they're, although they are, they are somewhat of a speculative market, um, they, they seem to have a bit more stability to them um, using, uh, but, and those, but those are not uh, the stable coins you're talking about. The um, uh, trying, to, trying to disconnect the, the speculative nature from, from the transactions, I think is really gonna be a, an important um, uh, um, step forward for some of the use cases that we're talking about. We don't want to have 
the global standard for identity management based on something that uh, where the costs associated with processing it are going to vary wildly, for instance. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and speaking of uh, the identity management use case, for example, uh, Jeff uh, McDowell had a question um, regarding government support of ID blockchain endeavors, uh, particularly the UK and EU, uh, given that British, British Airways, uh, British Airlines um, seems to be a leader uh, from what's been said. Mm -hmm. Uh, indeed, I think that, I mean, there's smaller countries who with uh, perhaps less of uh, an entrenched uh, bureaucracy have, have made a little bit more uh, progress. Um, but I think that there's strong interest. I mean, the governments at the end of the day can certainly see the, the cost savings um, that could come from, from uh, automating much of this. Uh, uh, frankly, it's, we're, we're unfortunately though gonna be moving at the speed of government. And as, as uh, you know, as enthusiastic as I am about um, the overall opportunity uh, when it comes to providing the, the overall experience, we're gonna have to wait potentially quite a while for, for some of the more, um, uh, I was gonna say advanced nations, but the company, uh, countries with the, with the most established bureaucracies to, uh, to move on that. Great. And uh, the last question uh, was another one that Gosh had uh, was regarding the distribution applications. Would those be on private blockchain or, or hybrids? Uh, they can be. Um, I think we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. I believe the guys from Arise and uh, and Winding Tree are going to be talking about uh, their approaches in the, in an upcoming session. Um, uh, I, I the I don't think there's anything about the nature of distribution that that states that it needs to be one or the other. Um, I think it'll really come down to what kind of ecosystem develops around that. Um, when uh, uh, you know, I, I can imagine. Um, either or, or the, the full continuum um, actually being effective in various different scenarios from that being from private to public to something in between. Yeah, definitely something we'll explore further in the upcoming uh, distribution focused uh, mm -hmm. webinar. Mm -hmm. So I think that is all of our questions. So I want to thank Max for his very well constructed and informative presentation summarizing the use cases for blockchain. And we look forward to seeing you all on our upcoming episodes for the series of blockchain webinars. Don't forget um, to register for the, the webinars at htng.org forward slash webinars. Also on that page, you will find all past webinars listed. Uh, you're welcome to review this recording and the other episodes of this webinar series. You probably know a few people who weren't able to make today's live webinar presentation and you're encouraged to direct your colleagues to access this recording and others on that website. If you have any other questions or feedback, you can certainly direct those to workgroups at htng.org. Thank you for joining.